While a majority of traffic incident management is seen logistics and response protocol, it is also important that we discuss legal and regulatory implications of our actions. We're going to identify specific laws that impact emergency workers operating on roadways, discuss elements of the manual on uniform traffic control devices, look at sections of the manual that affect emergency responders, and understand the laws as they pertain to the use of high visibility vests. So when we talk about legal and regulatory implications, we need to realize that there are laws, regulations, and standards that must be upheld. Everything has to interface with other documents and administrative requirements. There are also operational reasons such as ensuring proper response actions for having these documents in place. Now we're going to discuss aspects of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's also accessible for future use at this website. So Chapter 1 of the Manual discusses general responsibilities and compliance standards in accordance with the Highway Safety Act of 1966. It also discusses how state highway agencies must adopt the manual and meet its requirements. The most recent manual at this time is the 2009 edition. Now in section 1A.12 of the manual, it discusses 13 colors that are used for traffic control devices. Currently, 10 of the 13 colors are being used. For example, fluorescent pink indicates incident management. Now part 6 of the manual discusses temporary traffic control. Section 6D.03 clarifies elements of worker safety and traffic control. Training temporary traffic barriers, reduced speed, a clear activity area, and safety planning are all necessary elements for worker safety. One of the key elements of this section is that all workers and emergency responders within the right-of-way of traffic shall wear high visibility safety apparel. Shall wear is emphasized, meaning this is not optional. There is an exemption to this section, and that is firefighters or responders who are actively engaged in emergency operations that directly exposes them to fire, heat, flame, or other hazardous materials. This is because they will have the need for reflective turnout gear that can withstand these hazards. So here we can see a scene where the tow truck driver and law enforcement are wearing their high visibility gear. Also, you can see the police cruiser is blocking the working area of the tow truck operator. Now the manual also specifies standards for law enforcement. When uniformed officers are used to direct traffic, crash investigation, direct lane closures, obstructed roadways, and disasters, they must also wear high visibility gear. Law enforcement personnel are exempt from the manual section 6D.03 requirements when engaged in potentially confrontational law enforcement activities, such as traffic stops and searches, but they are required to wear high visibility apparel when directing traffic, investigating crashes, handling lane closures, or obstructed roadways or disasters. Every year, emergency responders are killed or injured after being struck while working on the roadway. We all know that drivers may not see you in the road in time to stop, especially during low light conditions. Studies show that wearing high visibility garments significantly improves your chances of being seen in time to avoid being struck while you are on the road. The Public Safety High Visibility Vest is specifically designed for emergency responders. The high visibility features are achieved by using both fluorescent green or orange background materials coupled with retro reflective striping. A public safety vest provides 360 degree visibility of the wearer during both daylight and low light conditions. The garments are easy to don and very easy to remove in an emergency. They provide easy access to weapons and other equipment worn on the belt and may be equipped with badge and microphone tabs as well as agency specific lettering. One of the most important features of the public safety vest is the five point breakaway option. The vest will break away if someone grabs and pulls at it or if it's hooked or caught by a passing vehicle. 
The public safety vest was designed by emergency responders for emergency responders. It is your best tool in the challenge to be visible. So moving on to section 60.03, worker safety. Some key elements to maintain safety are using a shadow vehicle, road closures, utilizing law enforcement, lighting, and special devices. Now using a flagger is helpful when you need someone who can be aware of and maintain public safety while making the greatest amount of public contacts. So per our manual, flaggers must be able to receive and communicate instructions maneuver quickly, control signaling devices, be able to understand and apply safe traffic control, and be able to recognize potentially dangerous traffic situations. Now we should all be familiar with the National Incident Management System, or NIMS classes. NIMS requires the use of the Incident Command System during three classifications of work scenes. The three are minor incidents, which last less than 30 minutes, intermediate, which lasts from 30 minutes to 2 hours, and major, which lasts more than 2 hours. So here are some photo examples of what qualifies as different types of incidents. You can see the minor is what we might consider more of a fender bender. The intermediate is a little more invasive but appears where vehicles are somewhat intact and should be fairly easy to clear. Major incidents are those where we are looking more at these overturned vehicles, larger vehicles such as semis or trucks, and maybe even have fatalities involved. Now the TIMS timeline lays out what happens from when an incident occurs until when the traffic conditions return to normal. The goal of TIMS is to shorten the distance between T0 and T6. The focus, however, should be on making incremental improvements during each phase rather than drastically reworking the way each responder performs their duties on scene. Such modifications can help in decreasing the overall duration of the timeline without having negative impacts on safety. Now every minute a lane is closed, the queue is building up. The likelihood of a secondary incident occurring increases by 2.8% for each minute a lane is closed, so every action counts. Some guidelines that are noted in Section 6 of our manual are to plan mutually with other agencies, utilize responders who are trained in these traffic control tasks to perform the tasks. All responders should utilize high visibility gear. This also includes media who may be reporting on or near the scene. Emergency vehicles should utilize safe positioning when parking on scene and responders should estimate the duration of the incident. This helps coordinate additional responders if needed and can help classify the level of incident. There are a couple circumstances to alternative incident command traffic control devices. In addition to the fluorescent pink background, incident command signs can also have a black legend and border. Also, if necessary, especially if the incident is emergent, you might just use any traffic control devices that you have on hand for the initial response as long as they don't create any additional hazard. So chapter 6 discusses control of traffic through the traffic incident management area. Now let's start by breaking down a major incident. This is going to be an incident lasting longer than 2 hours but no more than 24. There are other areas of the manual that discuss incidents over 24 hours. These kinds of incidents really need to have had some interagency planning. There also needs to be manual traffic control done by qualified flaggers or law enforcement. Flaggers need to use traffic control devices that are readily available or that can be on scene quickly. An intermediate incident lasts anywhere from 30 minutes to 2 hours. This will probably require some traffic control or route diversion. This also really needs to have had interagency planning. Again, manual traffic control needs to be performed by flaggers or law enforcement, and they can use traffic control devices they have available or that they can get to the scene quickly. 
Minor incidents are those that last less than 30 minutes. Detailed traffic control is not required and is the responsibility of the on-scene responder. This incident still does require interagency planning as it's important on all scenes that all agencies know what the others will do and what is expected of themselves. Vehicles should be moved to the shoulder as quickly as possible to avoid impeding traffic flow more than necessary. In section 6C.02, the manual discusses components of a traffic control zone. It discusses advance warning, the transition area, the activity area, including buffer and workspace, and the termination area. Now this diagram shows exactly where these areas are. We can see at the beginning of the incident we have the advanced warning area. This shows oncoming drivers that there is an incident ahead and warns them to begin slowly or merging. This diagram shows exactly where those areas are. We can see at the beginning of the incident we have the advanced warning area. This shows oncoming drivers that there is an incident ahead and warns them to begin slowly merging. The transition area is where the lanes of traffic begin to merge. This is before the first blocking vehicle. The activity area is the area that is deemed safe for patient care or other incident workings. This area is blocked by blocking vehicles, passing traffic has already merged and has slowed, and the patient care areas are protected. The termination area is where the traffic control devices begin to direct motorists back into normal traffic patterns. The incident should not be working in this space as drivers will be merging back into the incident lane. You'll also notice the guideline of 150 feet between each apparatus. We'll talk about some of the measurement guidelines when placing traffic control devices in response vehicles. So the manual discusses when establishing a traffic incident area that there are certain measurements that must be followed. When responders are establishing these traffic incident areas, they do not have to meet these distances exactly, but they should be working toward achieving them. Also note, if an incident is expected to last more than 24 hours, the manual distance requirements must be met. In the manual, Table 6C-1 gives recommendations for advanced warning sign spacing distances. This is a table from the 2009 manual along with a sample scene diagram at the bottom. It discusses the total distance that should be from the transition area to warning sign C. The shoulder taper was rounded up to the nearest 5 feet. This should also be used when multiple lanes are closed. When we close multiple lanes, we have higher risk of subsequent incidents or safety breaches as we are merging multiple lanes into one. Now all advanced warning devices should be placed so that they provide enough warning for vehicles to slow before reaching the traffic backup. The shoulder taper is used to advise motorists that the shoulder is closed ahead. Due to limited resources, which might be limited cone availability, a typical traffic incident management area will not include a shoulder taper. So the design of emergency traffic control warning and guide sign should have a diamond shape, black lettering and border, fluorescent pink background, and there are also two sizes to use depending on the traffic flow anticipated. This is an example of an advanced warning sign. A variable message or portable changeable message sign can also be used. Make sure you identify lighting, road, and weather conditions that should be taken into account when setting up an advanced warning area. Bad weather, such as rain, fog, and snow, will create significant responder risks. Wet roads double the average motorist stopping distance over that for dry road conditions, and poor visibility can lengthen driver reaction time. These combine increased responders' degree of risk. With these concerns in mind, the advanced warning area should be extended to compensate when such conditions exist.
Now, after seeing this video, think about how using appropriate traffic control devices to establish a traffic incident management area reduces the likelihood of secondary crashes. Some special considerations might be sun glare. This can significantly impact a driver's ability to see oncoming warning signs or the incident itself. Another advanced warning adjustment consideration is limited sight distances. A small elevation in the roadway can obstruct the approaching traffic's view. Once it has been determined that the incident is a limited sight distance situation, position your vehicle further upstream from the scene than normal to serve as advanced warning and keep your lights on. Contact other responding units and advise them of the exact location and request safe position for extended advanced warning. Set up temporary warning and traffic control with available cones and signs. Once sufficient resources are in place, set up to have a protected scene and effective extended advanced warning so there are no surprises to approaching motorists. Some best practices to consider when determining the need for advanced warning might include aero boards, flares, police cars, variable message signs, and also the news media or traffic report outlets. These things, along with others, can help notify motorists of potential incidents and to prepare them to yield earlier and more safely. Transition areas and tapers are where drivers are redirected out of their normal path. The transition area usually involves strategically placed tapers using cones or flares. Any taper is better than no taper, so if you're fixated on something specific and can't get it how you think it is just right, Remember that the use of any taper is better than none. The transition area might be near the blocking vehicle. It should be made with cones upstream from the block. Try to aim for 15 to 20 feet between cones, and the use of lighted flares can increase the visibility of these cones. This is an example of the transition area. It's upstream from the blocking vehicle and is where the lanes begin to merge into one. And this photo shows the buffer section of the activity area. It is past the transition area, but is kept fairly empty to keep a buffer of working space just in case it is needed or just in case vehicles haven't merged properly and continue to enter the incident area. The size of your buffer and workspace should be based off of the speed limit. Consider how long it may take vehicles to safely slow or stop and then merge. So this chart kind of shows a guide of how to calculate cone distance based off of speed limit. You can also place a cone at every skip line on the roadway. As we previously discussed, the taper lengths provided here are required for planned work zones and are our goal for responders to work towards when establishing traffic incident management areas. In many situations, especially early on, responders will simply not have the cones available to set up tapers of this length and will have to do the best they can with the resources they have. The ultimate goal of a taper is to have the taper appear as a straight line indicating the direction in which you want the motorist to move. So in this example, the skip lines are used to guide taper setup. For safety reasons, each time a cone is placed, the responder must return to the shoulder before walking to the next skip line. This methodology means that responders spend most of their time in the safety of the shoulder. If there are no skip lines, responders should lay out cones at a 10 to 1 ratio. For every 10 paces, a cone is placed one additional pace over, starting with the first cone on the white line of the shoulder. A typical pace is equal to approximately 3 feet. For example, with 5 cones, using this method creates a taper that is approximately 120 feet long. The buffer space covers the distance between the transition area and the incident space. The length of the upstream longitudinal buffer space is determined based on the stopping sight distance of a vehicle traveling at the posted speed limit. Lateral buffer space is the area between the incident space and the adjacent travel lane. Lateral buffer space can be beneficial because it allows for more room for responders to work. Lateral buffer space can be accommodated through the use of lanes plus one blocking. Partial lane closures are not recommended because they can confuse drivers and decrease scene safety. 
If you have to close part of a lane, then close the lane completely. Now once traffic control devices are in place, a shadow vehicle is positioned at the upstream end of the incident to protect workers from impacts by errant vehicles. In many cases, the original blocking vehicle will become the shadow vehicle. As outlined in our manual, the shadow vehicle should be positioned a sufficient distance in advance of responders and the incident scene being protected so that there will be sufficient distance, but not so much that the errant vehicles will travel around the shadow vehicle and strike the protected responders. The activity area or workspace is the actual location of the working incident. This might be where patient care or extrication is occurring. The termination area is used to notify drivers that the incident area is ending and they may resume normal traffic patterns. This also should include a downstream buffer space and taper. This helps protect responders at the end of the workspace. However, responders should remember that drivers often get frustrated having to slow down for traffic zones. They may accelerate quickly as they come through the transition area. This example shows a taper at the termination area. Remember, any responder who is exposed to traffic areas must wear high visibility garments. Firefighters work to save lives and property every day. You can't help anyone if you are struck by a vehicle while helping others. Vehicles strike many brother and sister firefighters each year because motorists didn't see them until it was too late. People aren't paying attention. And when they approach a the scene, they see emergency lights, so they focus on that. So if you go walking out to the traffic or something, they're not going to see it. The more visible a firefighter is, the better chance a driver has time to slow down and move over. Firefighters rely on equipment, training, and good common sense to ensure personal performance and safety. When it comes to being seen, there is low-cost gear that can help you to be safe. This high-visibility vest is designed to ensure that you are being seen while doing your job. High visibility means fluorescent and reflective. The emphasis has been on reflective trim only for many years. That helps us at nighttime. We need the fluorescent colors to give us high visibility in the daytime. Don't be fooled into thinking that your turnout coat can be seen as well as a high visibility vest. Wear your vest over your coat. Your turnout gear provides a certain level of protection, but it's not enough. The turnout gear for the most part does not have that many square inches of fluorescent markings on it, so the vest really plays a role in helping making us more visible in the daytime. Additionally, the high visibility vest has features designed to tear away at several points if the vest is hooked or caught on a passing vehicle. Take a look at these firefighters in this simulated traffic situation. With these high visibility fluorescent and retroreflective vests, not only are they visible, but people are able to recognize their role at the scene. The same image shown here without the vests shows how hard it can be to see you from an approaching vehicle. So in this specific case here, being visible on the roadways, uh, not only are you taking care of yourself, but think about it. I mean, you put yourself in the hospital for six weeks. Who's taking care of your family? What about the income? You know, things like that. Rule 634 that the federal government passed in late 2007 will take effect at the end of this year and basically requires any worker who's working in a federally funded highway to be wearing a high visibility vest. That includes firefighters. The high visibility vest is designed by your peers with you in mind. Wearing this vest will help you to be visible day and night. Be right. Be bright. Classifications of appropriate high visibility vests would be ANSI 107 Class 2 or 3 high visibility vests. These are required for all responders working on roadways. Remember, the only exception to this is if firefighters or other responders are directly exposed to flame, fire, heat, or hazardous materials. They should wear reflective turnout gear instead. Also, police officers in potentially adversarial roles, including traffic stops and searches, may have an exception. All other scenarios require high visibility vests. 
It is important to understand the laws and regulations impacting responders. It is also beneficial to become familiar with the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, Complying with visibility regulations and continuing to develop safety strategies can continue to improve our emergency responder roadside safety.